Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to lecture 13 of GPU computing. Today, we're going to talk about, new, about a new parallel pattern, which is histogram. Uh, so last time, uh, we spoke about scan. In particular, we spoke about the Brent Kung method for doing parallel scan. And we also looked at a thread coarsening for applied to scan and how that helped. Uh, uh, it, we saw the uh, pattern for doing the Brent Kung parallel inclusive scan. Uh, we said that the first part of that uh, involves doing a reduction step, uh, and then the second part involves doing a post-reduction step uh, that goes back and updates the values that are uh, not uh, not the, the right values so that we have a fully scanned array. Uh, and comparing Koji Stone to Brent Kung, we saw that Koji Stone uh, takes fewer, finishes in fewer steps, whereas Brent Kung uh, takes more steps. However, the Brent Kung approach uses uh, does fewer operations per step and fewer operations in total, which makes it more work efficient. Uh, so we saw that in general, the Koji Stone approach finishes in log n steps and requires O of n log n operations, whereas the Brent Kung approach needs uh, two log n minus one steps, so it takes more steps. However, it only performs O of n operations, so it's more work efficient than Koji Stone. And by work efficient, what we mean is, the, is um, uh, work efficiency relates to uh, how many operations the parallel algorithm performs with respect to uh, the sequential uh, the sequential uh, implementation? We also applied various optimizations to scan, uh, including using shared memory. Uh, and then another advantage of shared memory here, besides data reuse, is that it enabled coalescing because our access in scan was not coalesced. So by loading to shared memory and then work in a coalesced manner, and then working in shared memory that allowed us to uh, not have a problem with memory coalescing. We said we didn't need double buffering because in the way that the, the um, scan tree works, uh, you, you don't have any elements uh, that are read and written by different threads on the same iteration. Uh, and we also looked at how to minimize control divergence by rather than assigning a thread to a fixed element throughout the entire execution, re-indexing the threads on every iteration so that they, they own a different element of the input every time. Uh, we also looked at how uh, to do exclusive scan using the Brand Kung method. Uh, we said that the first approach uh, is to simply formulate it uh, like, uh, as an exclusive scan, like we did with the Koji Stone approach. But then the second approach was to use a different post-reduction step, uh, which uh, looked like this. Uh, and uh, and, and it, essentially what we do is we have the same uh, reduction step, but then after reduction, where we save the, the sum of all the elements and we replace that with a zero. And then we have this, this other stru tree uh, structure uh, where we eventually propagate the zero to the beginning and propagate the values and update them so that we have the exclusively scanned array. Uh, we didn't do the code for this one because uh, uh, this is uh, the, uh, for, because this is, you were supposed to implement this uh, in uh, your uh, homework assignment that's related. Um, finally, we spoke about work efficiency, and we said that even though the Brent Kung method has higher theoretical work efficiency, uh, in practice, its actual resource consumption, when you account for the inactive threads, uh, is actually closer to O of n log n. Uh, and uh, in, in practice, it turns out that uh, Brent Kung, although being more work efficient, uh, performs similar or maybe even worse than Koji Stone. In our, in our particular implementation, it actually performed worse. Uh, finally, thread coarsening uh, for, for scan. Uh, and we said that since uh, the scan, when we paralyze scan, we lose on work efficiency. Uh, if, uh, if the work is actually run in parallel, that's great. It's a, it's a worthy price to pay. However, if the hardware is gonna end up serializing our thread blocks, then the work efficiency that we, the, the work inefficiency that we paid uh, in order for us to paralyze is not really worth it. So what we can do is we can, uh, uh, we can apply thread coarsening uh, to uh, do, do, do a sequential scan in some of the threads. So here each thread would do a, a sequential scan of its own segment. Uh, and then we do a parallel scan of the partial sums and then redistribute them across uh, the segments that each thread owns. And by doing this, we improve the work efficiency of our algorithm because the sequential scan done by each thread is more work efficient than a uh, parallel scan in general. So this was a quick overview of what we covered last time. Any questions or is everything clear? Okay, uh, so then today we're going to talk about uh, a new parallel pattern, which is histogram. Uh, and using histogram, we're going to introduce a new feature 
uh, that the hardware provides us with, which is atomic operations. Uh, and we're also going to look at a new uh, category of optimizations, uh, and that is privatization. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, what is a histogram? A histogram uh, basically approximates a distri the distribution of a data set. And the way it does that is that it divides the range of values uh, that an, it, that uh, values in an input data set uh, can have into bins. Uh, sometimes they're also called buckets. Uh, and it counts uh, the number of values in the data set that fall inside of each bin. Uh, and an example of this, uh, where an example where histograms are commonly used, but of course not the only place, is color histograms. So for example, if I have an image, uh, an image can consist of pixels, uh, and these pixels uh, can have you know a range of values. Maybe I'm using uh, a um, uh, an eight bit uh, integer to represent each uh, pixel value. So pixel can be from zero to two fifty five. A cut what a color histogram of an image can do is that it count the number of pixels that fall in each range of values, and then the color histogram will give us some kind of summary of uh, how the colors in a picture are distributed, how bright or how dark, uh, or you know how much variance between bright and dark a picture is. Uh, um, uh, so an example of how to implement histograms sequentially uh, is as follows. Uh, we can simply have a loop, uh, and then the loop uh, goes from, uh, uh, you know, from zero uh, to width times height. The number of pixels in an image is width times height. Uh, so we can simply have a loop that goes from zero to the number of pixels in the image. Uh, and then we have we read uh, from the image the pixel value. So here, let's say the image is stored as a one dimensional array. Uh, so here the array image, the, its dimensions is its size is width times height. So for each pixel in the image, we read uh, the um, the value uh, of that uh, pixel. Uh, and then we're going to have, a, let's say these um, uh, this image, the pixels in the image were represented as unsigned cards, which are 8-bit integers. Uh, so let's, I can have uh, an array here. I'm going to call it bins, okay? Uh, and what I do is I simply increment the bins array, uh, increment the bin that corresponds to B, which is the color of the, of the pixel. So here, if the pixel value was 0, I increment bin 0. If the pixel value was 10, I increment bin 10. If the pixel value was 128, I increment bin 128. If the pixel value was 255, which is the maximum for 8-bit uh, integers, then I would increment the bin 255. Uh, and by the end of this, what I would have in my bins array uh, is basically the number of pixels uh, 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 for each uh, value uh, inside of the bins array. Okay? So this is how we can uh, perform a histogram sequential. Okay, we simply loop through the pixels, and for each pixel, we increment the corresponding. Bin. Now, how could we, how how can we uh, perform a histogram in parallel? What's one possible way to parallelize uh, performing a histogram operation? Any ideas? Divide the image among the threads, and each thread takes care of uh, uh, finding his own bins, and then we add up the bins. Uh, so you so divide the image across the threads, and then each thread is responsible for updating its own uh, its, uh, its its own bin. Yes, and that's a very uh, good approach. So what we can do is we can, in the spirit of uh, uh, transparent scalability, what we can do is we can uh, we can start off by going as fine grain as possible and assigning every thread to one uh, input uh, pixel in the image. And then every thread uh, will find the corresponding bin and update it. Okay, so let's uh, go and uh, implement this. Uh, so over here, uh, I've set up the code uh, for performing histogram on the GPU. Uh, as you can see, in uh, uh, the CPU code over here, I've allocated uh, a copy of the image on the device, and I've also allocated uh, a bins array uh, that uh, where whose size is num bins uh, and over here uh, the number of bins is uh, 256 okay because I, I, I we're using unsigned uh, car or or eight bit integers to represent uh, the image uh, so we're gonna have uh, 256 bins because we can have 256 possible values for eight bit integers okay 
so what we do is uh, we copy over here. I'm copying the image to the GPU. I'm also using CUDA memset. CUDA memset basically sets all the initializes all the values to some to some uh, number. So here I'm initializing all the bins to zero because they're all going to start at zero and then I'm going to start incrementing them. Uh, and then over here I'm calling the histogram kernel. I'm I'm giving it 1,024 threads per block. And then the number of blocks is basically going to be uh, the total number of uh, pixels in the image and then a ceiling division on the number of threads per block. And then finally, I copy back uh, the bins, which is what I'm interested in, uh, and I free the memory. Okay, so now let's go and implement our histogram kernel. And like we said, what we will do is we're going to assign a thread to every uh, a pixel in the image. Okay, so and just one thing to note, uh, I've, I've uh, created a 1D grid over here, not a 2D grid. Uh, and the size of the 1D grid is width and height. And the reason is that the distinction between 1D and 2D is not really important here. Whether the image is 1D or 2D is not very important because I'm not really doing anything with the rows or the columns. I'm simply just uh, get, treating each pixel as a value that I use to increment the histogram. Okay, uh, so I'm going to start off by finding uh, the element that the thread is responsible for. So I'm going to do unsigned int i is equal to block index dot x times block dim dot x plus thread index dot x. You should be familiar with this by now. Okay, and then uh, what we're going to do uh, is, of course, we need to check if i is within bounds. So the image, the size of the image is width times height. So then uh, what I'm going to check is I need to check if i is within bounds. So I'm going to do if i is less than width times height. Okay. Uh, and then inside, if, inside of this if statement, if i am within bounds, what I'm going to do is, uh, well, let's, sequentially what I did is I loaded the input in the, the, the pixel value and then I used it to increment the bin. So I can do something very simple over here. I can write unsigned unsigned int b is equal to image of i. Okay, oops, I'm not supposed to use int, I'm supposed to use r because it's an 8-bit integer. Okay, uh, and then I'm going to uh, do plus plus bins of b. Okay. Well, let's compile this and see if it works. I'm going to close. I'm going to compile. Okay, and I am going to run. Uh, and, uh-oh, we have a mismatch at bin zero, and it doesn't work. Okay, uh, and as I, as I can tell in the chat, you guys are expecting this not to work. Uh, and what is the reason why it doesn't work? Everyone is accessing bin B at the same time. The accesses to the bins are not uh, synchronized. Right, exactly. So I have many different threads are accessing the same output value in bins. Okay. Uh, and when many different threads uh, start trying to read and write from the same memory location without coordinating with each other, uh, bad things start to happen. Okay. And the reason is uh, that uh, this, uh, this plus plus bins of B is not kind of one operation that happens kind of on its own. It con consists of multiple instructions. Okay. Uh, and the way these instructions are interleaved affect whether this behaves correctly or not. Okay, so to take a better, so this is the code that we just wrote. And like we said, we saw there's something wrong with this implementation. And what's wrong with, with this implementation is, uh, you know, as, as uh, you, you guys have written in the chat, we have something called a race condition, okay? So let's take a look at race condition. So a data race occurs uh, when multiple threads access the same memory location concurrently without ordering, and at least one of these accesses is a write. Okay, so when multiple threads are trying to access the same memory location, and at least one of these accesses is a write, uh, we have something called a data race, uh, and a data race may result in unpredictable program output. Let's, uh, let's see uh, why this is the case. If we go back to our bins example over here, uh, when we write plus plus bins of B, 
there's multiple things going on here. Uh, we have a load instruction that loads the old value of B. And then we have an add instruction that adds that one to that value so that we have a new value. And then we have a store instruction that stores the new value of B. Okay. Now, when I have multiple threads, thread A and thread one, both executing the, the sequence, the sequence of instructions in parallel. Okay. If both of these threads have the same value of B, then both of these threads will be loading an old, an old value of bins of B from the same location. Both of them will be incrementing it, and both of them will be storing a new value of B. And depending on the order in which uh, the, the, these, these uh, instructions are, are executed in parallel, okay, uh, we can actually uh, have, uh, if the bins, if bins of B was initially zero, the outcome of this could be uh, that bins of B will become two, which is what we would want, or it could actually become one. And let's see uh, why this would be the case. So, for example, and if, if I look at the, the instructions uh, or the kind of the uh, not instructions, but they're like kind of pseudo statements in the previous uh, code or pseudo instructions, um, over here, uh, if these operations uh, are interleaved in this way, so if thread A, uh, if here I have time uh, is going vertically, if thread A runs completely before thread B, so thread A loads, adds, and then stores before thread B does, and then later on thread B comes and loads, adds, and stores, then over here I don't have a problem. I'm going to load zero, add to it, store one, and then here I will load one, add to it, and then store two. Okay, same thing if the instructions or the operations done by thread B uh, run completely before the ones uh, by thread A, then again, I don't have a problem. Thread B will load zero, add one, and then store one. And then thread A will load one, add one, so that you have two, and then store two. Okay, so in these two scenarios, the final value of bins of B will be two, which is what we would like. However, there is no guarantee that this is actually how these uh, instructions or operations will be interleaved by the hardware. So, for example, another possible interleaving uh, is that uh, the hardware may execute these instructions or operations like this. It may, we, uh, thread A may load bins of B, so it loads zero, and then increment it to where new val is one. And then before thread A gets the chance to store new val in bins of B, what happens is the hardware scheduler removes thread A and then comes and schedules thread B. Okay, that's if they're running on the same SM. If they're running on completely different SMs or in completely different places, they may actually be executing in parallel, but somehow because of you know the way timing works when you're when things are running in parallel, somehow threads B thread B manages to load bins of B, uh, which is still zero, before thread A is able to store one inside of bins of B. So in this case, thread A is going to load load zero, it's going to add one to it. So now new val is one. But before it stores new val, thread B will load bins of B, which is still zero. And now old val here is zero. Uh, and then thread A will come and store a one. But then thread B had already loaded a zero, so it will increment the zero to one. And then thread B will also store a one. And in this case, well, we have a data race because both of these threads are trying to write to the same location. Uh, and what will happen is rather than bins of B getting incremented twice, it's only going to be incremented once and the result will be a one. And a similar thing could happen uh, if thread B, uh, you know, if thread B went first uh, loaded, uh, but then before thread B got to store, thread A uh, was able to uh, load. Okay, so in these two scenarios, you know, and many other possible interleavings, uh, the final result of bins of B is going to be one. Okay, is this clear to everyone? Any questions about data races? So how do we solve this problem? How do we avoid data races? On CPUs, how do we solve this problem? Uh, we use monitors and uh, uh, semaphores. Right, well, there's all kinds of ways to synchronize across threads. Okay, semaphores are, 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 are one way, you know, uh, and and uh, the the bottom kind of the bottom line is that what you want to do is you want to have these threads execute 
uh, the sequence of operations, uh, load, add, and store in a mutually exclusive way. Okay, so the the way to avoid uh, this kind of behavior is through mutual exclusion. Okay, so to avoid data races, concurrent read, modify, write operations in the same memory location need to be made mutually exclusive in order to enforce ordering. All right, so for example, in CPU, what is one way to uh, enforce mutual exclusion? What do we use? A mutex. Right, a mutex or a lock. Okay, so one way to do this on the CPU is using locks. Sometimes you also call these mutexes. So for example, if I have this plus plus bins of B, what I can do is I can put a lock before it. I do mutex lock for some lock, uh, and then I increment it, and then I do mutex unlock and release the lock. Okay. Now, if I do this, what happens is if a thread comes and does on the CPU, if a thread comes and does mutex lock and acquires a lock, then no other thread can acquire this lock until this thread releases the lock. So a thread comes, executes mutex lock, increments bins of B. This can have as many instructions as you want inside of here, and then it releases the lock. And once it releases the lock, another thread can come and acquire the lock to increment bins of B. Okay. So, for example, if we use mutex locks as in our example over here, if I put a mutex lock before and after incrementing bins of B, then what happens is a thread A comes, it does mutex lock, uh, and now that thread A does mutex lock, thread B cannot acquire the lock until thread A has released it. So, because thread B cannot acquire the lock until thread A has released it, thread B will not be able to load the old value of bins until uh, thread A has written it. Okay, so here we do mutex lock. We read the old, read the old value of bins, uh, increment it, write to it, and then we do mutex unlock. And then thread B will come along and we'll do a lock, and then it will read and modify and write, and then it'll unlock. Okay, so here thread B cannot acquire the lock before thread A releases it, or vice versa. Now somebody is asking, won't this make uh, the execution essentially sequential. And yes, that's absolutely true. And that is what we want, right? Whenever we have multiple threads ex updating the same memory location, okay, we want them to execute sequentially uh, because we don't want uh, us, we won't, don't want to have a race condition. However, keep in mind that different threads might be up updating different values at the same time, okay? So one thing that can be done is we can have a different lock for each one of these bits or each set of bins. That way, if threads are updating different bins, they can, they can do that in parallel. However, if threads are updating the same bin, then uh, they those updates will be serialized. Okay? Clear? Professor, is it not, is it not possible for two threads to acquire the lock at the same time? Uh, well, it, on CPUs, the way locks work is that no. Uh, only one thread can acquire a lock at the same time. If two threads can acquire the lock at the same time, then that beats the whole purpose of having locks. So the idea of a lock is that only one thread can acquire it, uh, and and no other thread can acquire it until that thread has released it. So okay. it's a, it's a built-in function, right? It's not like uh... I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm not talking about CPUs now. Okay. So again, I, I, yeah. I've kind of potentially been saying that on CPUs, if you want to do this, the way you would do it is using something like mutex lock. So this here is, these are like pseudo instructions or pseudo operations. Okay, I'm not talking about GPUs yet. Okay. This is actually a very bad idea on GPUs. Can, I, can anybody tell me why? We're killing parallelism. What? We're killing the parallelism. We well, we, 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 also, we also heard the parallelism on, on, on CPUs, right? When we use uh, locks, uh, it's, it's inevitable to hurt parallelism when you have contention on the same output, okay? There's all kinds of optimizations we can do, but at some point you will need some kind of serialization when you're trying to have multiple threads update the same look. So that's inevitable. But Wouldn't this? Uh, this is not a very good idea on GPUs. Wouldn't this uh, be uh, like have the similar kind of effect as synchronizations? 
I mean, I don't know about mutex, but maybe. So, so, uh, so locking is a way of doing synchronization. Before we saw barrier synchronization, and now we're seeing locking as a form of doing synchronization when you do parallel tuning. I mean, as overhead um, to the computation. Right, so synchronization has an overhead. Uh, it hurts our performance. Uh, but again, you know, that's this is inevitable, right? Uh, if you want to have, uh, it, it's inevitable for you to have to pay some performance penalty in order for you to uh, allow threads to update uh, the same output concurrent. But it's still better than going completely sequential, right? It's still better than being completely sequential. At least you have some parallelism, uh, and wherever you have the possibility of two threads uh, colliding with each other, you, you serialize them. Uh, but in general, you still have parallelism. So yes, the uh, drawback is that we, it hurts our performance, but there's, there's something worse that can happen if we try to do something like this on a deep Divergence? Yes. Is it the divergence that is caused by the different locks and unlocks, uh, like the different mutexes or whatever the period is being locked and so, unlocked? So you're closer. It does have to do with divergence. Does anybody see a potential problem that's related to divergence here? Oh, maybe to if you say more. Think I think uh, every every basically this will be like super divergent. You can say because like every thread will stop and work like at different uh, uh, times. Um, well, I mean, uh, yes, you will have you'll have some divergence. Okay, if um, like, okay, let me let me not give it away. Let me let me continue uh, and and explain. Uh, Explain why this is a problem in the context uh, of divergence. I wasn't I wasn't thinking about uh, divergence as being a source of inefficiency. I was thinking about something uh, uh, something even worse than that. So let's uh, let's take a look at what happens. Um, so locks and SIMD execution. Let's assume that threads zero and one are in the same war, and both threads zero and one try to acquire the same lock. Okay, so threads zero and one are both in the same board, and both threads zero and thread one try to acquire the same lock. Okay, so we have this code over here, mutex lock, uh, and then we uh, we have old equals bins of B, uh, and then et cetera, right? Because we had multiple the, the plus plus bins of B uh, had multiple uh, you know multiple uh, operations, and then we have mutex unlock. Okay, so threads zero and one all try to acquire a lock. Okay. However, only one thread can acquire the lock, obviously. So thread zero acquires the lock. Okay. Now, uh, the way locks work is that when a thread tries to acquire a lock and is not successful, it, it stays there on that same kind of operation until it succeeds at acquiring the lock. So when thread zero successfully acquires the lock and thread one, which is in the same war, tries to acquire the lock and does not succeed, what does thread one do? It spins. Right, so thread one is going to sit here and wait for thread zero to release the lock. All right? So now thread zero acquires the lock. Thread one sits here and waits for thread zero to release the lock. But thread zero and thread one are in the same warp, right? What does that mean? That means that whenever they make progress, whenever they ex when they want to go to execute the next instruction or the next operation, they need to do it together, correct? So can thread zero go and execute the next instruction without uh, thread one coming along with it? Can't it be like an if condition where you can you keep going and then you go back to thread one later on when its condition kind of resolves? So, so there there are ways around this. You can use something called lock free algorithms. So what you're proposing deviates away from uh, what we what we commonly call locks. Okay. Okay. Um, so there are lock free algorithms where you can work around this somehow. Um, but but if we just if we just look at the uh, this idea of mutex locking, right? 
uh, what happens is thread zero cannot make progress. Thread zero cannot come and execute the next instruction because it's bound to thread one by Cindy. So thread zero is waiting for thread one to complete the previous instruction before it can continue. And thread one is waiting for thread zero to release the lock so that it can continue to the next instruction. So what happens in this case? Right, we have a deadlock. So using locks with SIMD execution may cause deadlock. Okay, because here thread one is going to be spinning, waiting for the lock to be released by thread zero, and thread zero is going to be bound to thread one by, by SIMD, waiting for it to finish what it needs to do so that they can proceed together to the next instruction. Okay. So this idea of using locks on GPUs, uh, the drawback is actually even worse than performance uh, a performance hit. Uh, we can actually run into a situation where uh, we get deadlock. Okay. So what's the way around this? How do okay. we? Yes, question. Uh, just a question. Yes. Uh, why don't uh, they do, then? Do, why don't they do mutexes around blocks instead of threads? Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, uh, instead of blocking, yeah, uh, instead of blocking accesses to all other threads, block access to all threads that are uh, not uh, that are not inside the current block accessing it. But what if what if the two threads that are updating bins of B are in the same block? Ah, okay, okay, I see. Uh, you you could you could have a way around that, la. Uh, well, right. You, I mean, right. But you know, then then you start getting into a complicated solution. And there's actually something uh, um, better than this that we can do, and that is uh, atomic operations. Okay. So what are atomic operations? Atomic operations are operations uh, on the GPU that perform read, modify, write uh, operations with a single ISA instruction. Okay. So a single instruction reads a memory location, updates it, and writes the result, okay? Uh, and because, and uh, what happens is that if the hardware guarantees that no other thread can access uh, the memory location until this operation completes, okay? So rather than guaranteeing uh, the mutual exclusion in the software, these atomic operations guarantee the mutual exclusion in the hardware, okay? Uh, and then if, if it happens that we have concurrent atomic operations to the same memory location, these will be serialized by the hardware rather than being serialized by the software. So for example, if two threads uh, in the same warp perform an atomic operation on the same memory location, then what happens is that the hardware will take these two operations, serialize them, and then go back uh, to the threads when both operations are complete. Uh, there are different kinds of atomic operations in CUDA. Uh, the one that's relevant to what we're uh, looking at today is atomic add. So atomic add is an is an uh, is a uh, it's an atom it's an it translates to instruction uh, on the G in, on the GPU, uh, but it's basically a call inside of CUDA. Uh, where you give it an address and you give it a value, and what it does is that it adds that value to uh, the uh, uh, to the value stored at this address and returns the old value. Okay, so here T uh, atomic a atomic add takes a pointer to a T uh, and a value T and returns a value T, and in this case T can be an integer, it can be an unsigned integer, it can be a float, it can be a double, etc. All right. Uh, what the atomic add instruction does, like I said, is that it reads the value stored at address, it adds val to the value stored at address, uh, and, and it stores the new value at address, uh, uh, which is the result of adding the old value to val, and it returns the old value that was originally stored at that address. Because sometimes when we do an atomic add, uh, we, are, we would like to observe what the old value uh, that was stored in this location was. Uh, for example, we might be doing an atomic add to uh, maybe reserve some space in some queue. Uh, so when we do the atomic add, we want to know what the old value was to, so that we can figure out what was the location in the queue that we received. 
Okay, so maybe we're doing atomic atom encounter uh, that uh, that that uh, points to the end of something. But that's not what we're doing today. Today we're just looking at uh, history. Uh, so this function call uh, inside of CUDA translates to a single ISA instruction. Okay. And we actually have a name for these kinds of instructions. They're called intrinsics. Okay, so usually uh, when, when we have these uh, function calls in CUDA that translate down to a single ISA instruction, uh, we usually call these intrinsics, these kinds of functions intrinsics. And we will look at other kinds of intrinsics later on, actually. Uh, but for now, we're interested in atomic operation. Okay, and there are other options available uh, for, uh, uh, there are other kinds of atomic operations available. Uh, we have subtract, min, max, increment, decrement, uh, and or XOR, atomic exchange, atomic compare and swap. Uh, you know, I mean, so there's all kinds of atomic operations that are available in CUDA. Uh, the one that we care about today is atomic add. Somebody's asking a very good question. Somebody asking, can we do these atomic operations on shared memory? And the answer is yes. So you can do atomic operations on global memory, and you can also do atomic operations on shared memory. It's a very good question. So now let's go back to our code uh, and uh, see what we have. So what we were doing previously uh, is we were incrementing bins of B. So we're basically reading the value uh, at bins of B, adding one to it, and then storing the result. Uh, well, to do this correctly, what we should do is we should replace this uh, operation over here, which, which, which has race condition, with an atomic add that will make sure that the addition happens atomically. And how do we do that? Well, just as a reminder, atomic add takes the address uh, of uh, the memory location we would like to add to, the value that we would like to add, uh, and it does the addition. So here I'm going to write atomic add. I'm going to give it the address that I want to that I want to update. In this case, that will be the address of bins of B. Okay. Uh, and I want to give it the value that I would like to add. In this case, I'm just adding one, right? Uh, and now that I have this atomic add instead of this plus plus bins of B, uh, let's now compile and run this and, and see uh, if it works. I'm going to compile. Uh, okay. Professor, and uh, going to run. Yes. Uh, well, I, I don't understand you know, why, uh, why why would an atomic add or a single, an instruction that executes the read, write, and everything together, you know, well, how does it solve our problems? Ma, ma, if uh, it's not about the deadlock, it's about the, uh, you know, you will have a, maybe a wrong value if, if you're trying to it, it read solves, at the same time. It solves our problem because, um, as we said, uh, warps, uh, follow, we follow the SIMD model. So warps use the single instruction multiple data model, which means that all threads in the warp execute the same instruction, and then they move on together to execute the next instruction. So our problem previously was uh, the threads in the warp, uh, they come and they execute if, hypothetically, if we, were try, if we, were try, we had some kind of locks on the GPU that we we're trying to use, these threads in the warp will come to acquire the lock. So presumably that's going to be an instruction or set, a set of instructions. Okay. But then they can't move on to execute the next instruction before the other thread finishes executing the previous one. And that is why we have the deadlock. But if this whole thing, the read, modify, write, is just a single instruction, then all of these threads are going to execute that atomic add instruction. Uh, and they, and these, these atomic add operations. Uh, the, the read, modify, write operations will happen in the hardware. Okay, we're not having all the threads try to uh, try to acquire a lock before they read, modify, write. Sorry, but across blocks, uh, across blocks, you will still have problems. No. Why? Why do you think we would have problems across blocks? Oh no, uh, because uh, because. Uh, uh, if you're, uh, for example, if you're accessing and you modified it in, in in one block, maybe that the other block that access that is accessing it will access the new value or something like that. But that's what you want, right? If you have different threads and different thread blocks updating the bins array, okay. If you have different threads and different thread blocks updating the bins array, you want to be able to have uh, threads the threads in the other block. Uh, see the updated value of the threads in the block that you're in. 
right? If I have different threads and different blocks, one of them updates the value, I do want the other thread to see that updated value. Okay. Um, uh, it depends on your application, yeah. Right, but in, in our particular application here, histogram, okay, I have all these threads, are uh, all the threads in the different blocks are reading the same image, uh, and they're updating uh, the bins to do a histogram. So here, if I have different threads and different blocks responsible for different pixels, I do want, and they happen to find the same pixel value, I do want them to see each other's update. Okay, I see, I see. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, professor? Yes? Uh, couldn't we just assign, instead of one element per thread, assign some number of elements, let's say, I don't know, uh, 16 or something, and then run the threads on, like, generate different histograms for each thread, and then uh, merge them together? Uh, yes, we can actually do that, and uh, we will, we will, uh, we will, I, I'm about to uh, get to that optimization. Okay, so yes, that's a, that's a good observation. Okay, so before we get there, actually, let's uh, go back and observe uh, the uh, performance improvement. Uh, so here uh, in the GPU, it was taking 9 milliseconds, on the CPU, it was taking 9 milliseconds, on the GPU, if we ignore the copy time, it's also taking about the same time. Okay, so actually we haven't really seen much performance improvement uh, on the GPU compared uh, to the CPU, but there are actually various performance optimizations that we can apply to significantly improve the performance of histogram, and let's talk about those. Okay, um, so uh, first let me go back to where we uh, left off. Uh, uh, this here is the code uh, that we just wrote. We changed plus plus bins of B to atomic add. Uh, uh, we take the address of bins of B and we add one to it. And what this does is that it, so it solved our race condition and our code now has correct results. Okay, now uh, let's now talk about optimization. So if we look uh, at what's going on, uh, we have these uh, this input over here. Okay, and we have these different thread blocks. Each thread block is responsible for part of the input. Each thread is responsible for one pixel in the input. And if multiple threads all have the same pixel value, all of these threads are going to be updating the same, uh, the same uh, bins. Okay, so this here represents our bins. Okay, so our atomic operations and global memory uh, have high latency. Okay, and the reason is that one, we need to wait for both read, modify, and write to complete, okay? So the atomic operation is not just a read, and it's not just a write. It's a read, modify, and write, okay? And that's why this atomic operation takes a very long time to complete, so it really slows down my thread. And even worse, uh, when I have all these different threads are all trying to update the same global memory location, uh, we need to wait if there are other threads accessing uh, the same location, uh, and, and uh, if, specifically if there's a high probability of contention. So here, uh, when this thread tries to update this memory location, it's, it already takes long enough for me to read this value from global memory, modify it, and then wait for it to get written back to global memory. That already takes a very long time. Imagine that I also need to wait for, not only for me to read, modify, and write, but if there are three or four or 10 or 15 or thousands of other threads before me that are reading, modifying, and writing, I need to wait for all these other threads to read, modify, and write before I get to the chance to read, modify, and write. So obviously these atomic operations take a very long time to complete. And uh, what we would like to do is we would like to optimize this so that we can do better than nine and a half, than, you know, uh, you know Compare, comparably or even worse to what the CPU is doing. Uh, and the first optimization that we'll talk about in order to do this is called privatization. Okay, so from the name, what do you guys think we will do in order for us to uh, improve the performance and reduce the contention? Uh, make synchronization only for the thread, for the bin, I mean, for one bin. 
So make uh, I don't really know how to explain it, but you know, for every bin, make its axis different. So the the way atomic add works is that if I have atomic adds to different bins, they will they will already uh, run in parallel. Okay, so they're not really going to be serialized. So so it's almost like having a lock for each bin. Okay, if if that is what you uh, what you uh, what you were referring to. Oh, okay, okay. So what we, one thing we can do is we can is is and this is called privatization, and this is the this is a common category of optimizations that we apply whenever we have different threads that are contending on a shared output. Uh, what we can do is we can instead of this universal copy of the histogram that all the threads are updating at the same time, we can privatize the histogram. And what that means is that I can create a private copy of the histogram for each thread block. Okay, and then each thread block will uh, will update its private copy of the histogram. And what that means is, if threads in the same thread block are updating the same bin, they will they will contend only inside of their own private copy of the histogram. They're not going to contend with all the threads in the other uh, thread blocks that want to update that bin. So we absorb some of the contention uh, in the private copies of the histogram. So each block updates a private copy of the histogram. And then when the thread block is done executing, what the thread block, the threads in the thread block can do is they can go back and commit the, the, and use the values in their private, that they've accumulated in their private copy of the histogram and commit those uh, to the global copy atomically. So now if, if, the, th if the threads and so the, in this thread block, update the blue bin 10 times rather than contending 10 times in the global copy with these other threads in the other blocks. They will contend 10 times with each other only in this local copy, and then they will only perform one update to the global copy. Uh, so, and what this does is that it reduces the amount of com competition or contention between threads in different thread blocks in order to reduce the amount of serialization that occurs. Okay, is this clear to everyone? And of course, when we update the global copy, we don't have to go and update all the the bins in, in uh, all the bins in my private copy to the global copy, only the non-zero ones. So if I haven't updated any bins over here, there's, it's not necessary for me to do an atomic operation to add a zero to the global copy. Uh, professor, yes, question. Can we actually add them kind of like a reduction tree, like have uh, thread add the different partial histograms of uh, um yes you can possibly do that you can add uh, if you can uh, perform a reduction across uh the different uh values using a reduction tree uh usually a reduction tree is worth it when you have a lot of values that you'd like to add together if i don't have too many private copies maybe it's uh, maybe an atomic add is worthwhile but if i have many many private copies then perhaps looking at a reduction tree approach uh might be worth it whether or not a reduction is worth it or just doing an atomic add is, uh, is uh, you know, is completely, uh, uh, you know, it depends on the situation and programmers could try uh, either approach. But speaking of reduction, by the way, uh, if you remember what we did uh, in uh, reduction uh, is we had each thread block do its own local reduction to find the partial sum for all the elements that the thread block is responsible for. <laughs> Excuse me. And then they stored these uh, partial sums in an array, and we performed a reduction on that array. Another thing that we could have done is we could have uh, used atomic operations. So we could have had just had a global sum, and then when the thread block performs a reduction to find the sum of all the elements it's responsible for, we could have just performed an atomic operation to commit its sum to the global sum. And this would have saved us the hassle of having to load a second kernel to do the reduction of the partials. So thank you for uh, reminding me about reduction. Okay. Uh, so in general, privatization is an optimization where multiple private copies of an output are maintained, then a global copy of is updated uh, on completion. Okay, now for privatization to work, 
the operations on the output must be associative and commutative because the order of the updates has changed. Okay, so for example, the reason privatization works for histogram is because uh, the addition operation is associative and commutative. So if I change the order, it's uh, it's okay. All right, but depending on the operation, privatization may or may not work. The advantages of privatization are, as we saw, uh, it reduces contention on the global copy. But there's another advantage, which is that if the output is small enough, the private copy can actually be placed in shared memory, which reduces the access latency. So here in our example, uh, if these private copies of the histogram are small enough, okay, then we can actually put them in shared memory, do the atomic updates on shared memory, which is even faster, and then commit the uh, local copy from shared memory to global memory. And this would be like applying shared memory tiling to the privatized copies of the histogram. Okay, but even even if uh, even if these private copies uh, are too large to fit in shared memory, privatization is still applicable uh, because uh, we can we can create private copies in global memory. We wouldn't get the benefit of uh, reducing the global memory latency, but we still get the benefit of reducing the contention. Okay, uh, so privatization. A lot of times privatization is combined with shared memory where we put the private copy in shared memory. Uh, logically, these are two different optimizations. The idea of privatizing an output to reduce the contention and putting the privatized output in shared memory uh, in order to reduce the access latency. These are logically two different optimizations, but a lot of time these two optimizations are applied uh, together. Uh, and here in histogram, this is an example of where we would apply it. And we will look later on in the course at where uh, we will combine privatization and shared memory tiling in a different scenario where, we're, where many threads are trying to add to some shared view. Okay. Any questions about privatization? So if I wanted to uh, implement privatization, it's not too difficult. What I would do is I would declare a shared memory array over here that uh, that that has as as many elements as the number of bins, okay? And then I would initialize that array to zero, uh, and then I would uh, do this atomic add on the shared memory version of the of the bins, and then when I'm done, I will use the threads to in parallel commit any non-zero bins from the shared uh, copy of the bins that I declared to the global copy, okay? Uh, I'm not going to implement it with you in class because you guys. Uh, will be responsible for implementing uh, privatization and shared memory tiling of uh, histogram for your assignment. Okay, uh, but this is uh, the strategy for follow that you should follow to do it. You declare uh, an, a shared memory array of uh, the bins. You initialize them to zero. Uh, you do the atomic add on the shared memory bins, and then you commit the shared memory bins uh, to the global uh, the global uh, bins uh, when you are done. Okay, so having said this, uh, sorry. Yeah, my question was, uh, is it better to do that later with another, like dispatching another kernel or having one thread of each block in the kernel? Do well, the, you won't be able to do it later because if you put the shared memory bins inside of shared memory, oh, uh, right. they're not going to be there when you launch another kernel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Remember, the, sorry. Shared, the scope of the visibility of the shared, the scope of the shared memory is at the thread block. So, one, or the lifetime is a thread block. So, once the thread block is gone, Whatever is in the shared memory uh, is also gone. Right, thank you. Okay, okay um, so having said this, uh, another optimization that we can apply is uh, thread coarsening. Okay, so remember we said that uh, whenever there's some kind of price that we pay for parallelization, uh, then uh, th we can apply thread coarsening to reduce the price when uh, when uh, um, the hardware uh, when we know if the, the hardware is going to serialize it because we have too much parallel. So how does thread course how would thread coarsening benefit us with histogram and privatization? What is the price we are paying for parallelization?
So by having more and more thread blocks running in parallel, we have more and more private copies that need to be committed to the global copy. Now, if these thread blocks are actually going to run in parallel, that's worth it. But if these thread blocks are going to serialize, get serialized, it's better for me to have fewer thread blocks so that I have more updates on the on the same private copies and fewer updates and fewer private copies that I need to commit to the global copy. Okay. So using fewer thread blocks results in fewer private copies, hence fewer global memory atomics to update the global copy. So if we apply thread coarsening to reduce the number of blocks and have each thread count multiple inputs, uh, we can reduce the number of private copies that we need to commit. Okay. Uh, and of course, when we do this, we should make sure to load uh, our input in a coalesce way. So for example, in our original example, we had each thread block, each thread in the thread block responsible for one uh, input element, okay? And each thread block had its own private copy uh, and that, that, it, that it committed to the global copy when it was done. And that's reflected in the code over here. Well, not really, but here in, the, in our code, each uh, thread was responsible for one uh, input element, okay? So uh, if we apply privatization here, each thread will still be responsible for one input element. Well, one thing we can do is we can have fewer thread blocks and have every thread block responsible for a lot larger segment of the input. Okay. And if we do that, then these threads now, uh, each thread will need to process multiple inputs. So each block is going to take a larger input segment. Uh, each one of these threads will be responsible for multiple inputs. And of course, uh, when we do this, we need to make sure that these threads load the input in a coalesced way. So I shouldn't make this thread load one, one, two inputs, and this thread load three, four, and then this thread loads uh, five, six, et cetera. Instead, I should have all these threads load this part of the segment, and then all these threads come together and they load this part of the segment so that I make sure I'm loading the input in a coalesced way. But once I do that, each thread will be, be responsible for reading multiple inputs and updating the private copy. And then at the end, I have fewer private copies that I need to commit to the global copy. So fewer private copies to commit to the global copy. What this does is that it further improves performance by further reducing the number of global atomic operations that I need to perform. Okay, so I do more operations on my private copy. If my private copy is in histogram, is, is in shared memory, that's even better. Um, so I, uh, and then I would finally uh, do fewer commits to the global copy uh, so that I have this few uh, global memory atomic operations as possible. Is that clear to everyone? Okay, and the way to do that is by, you know, simply uh, after you apply privatization, you can simply have a loop around your, uh, your, where you have a loop around where you index the input elements. Uh, so that each thread will have multiple values of i uh, within within uh, within some input segment that the block is responsible. Again, I will not uh, implement this with you in class uh, because I will leave it for you. I will leave this for you as an exercise to do um, in the assignment. Uh, since by now you guys uh, should be experts at using shared memory and applying thread course. All right. Okay. So. Uh, uh, you can read more about what we covered today in chapter nine of the textbook. Uh, and that is all I have for today. Any final questions before we end? Yes, I want to ask, uh, how is the, how are the atomic operations implemented in hardware? Like, uh, is it the same instruction sent to the warp itself or, uh, or since they're bound by SIMD, since threads in, this, in a warp are bound by SIMD. So how, how, how should we schedule the instruction? So when multiple threads in the same war perform atomic operations, the hardware will receive these atomic operations and make sure that they are they are all done, uh, they are all completed before uh, control is returned to the warp so that it continues execution. I, I don't know if that answers your question. How exactly is the atomic operation being done? Where exactly in the in the in the hardware and in the hierarchy it's it's taking place? Uh, I, I think that is something that is um, uh, not uh, not public information um, and, and is usually hardware specific. Okay, thank you. Okay.
a professor uh, yes. about the term uh, can you can you maybe uh, provide us with uh, something that you know some exercises so that we know how it will come and uh, everything okay yeah feel free to ask me uh, uh questions about the midterm after uh, uh we're we're done with the lecture okay thank okay you. doctor uh, yes. Can we use uh, atomic operations with the Kuji stone instead of double buffers? Uh, so, so the the um, uh, double buffering and atomic operations were intended for uh, different things. Uh, the problem with uh, with uh, when we did double buffering on Co in the Kuji stone uh, algorithm, we wanted to make sure to read the old value in one thread before the other thread writes the new value. Uh, here, when we're using atomic operations, uh, we don't care which thread reads the old value and which thread write. You know, we don't care when two threads are trying to read, modify, write the same location. We don't care which one goes first. Okay, as long as they both do the work that they need to do in a mutually exclusive way. In in the case where we were did we applied double buffering to co to the Koji stone approach, here we did care. We wanted one thread to be able to read before the other thread got the chance to write. So it wasn't mutual exclusion that we cared about. It was that we wanted to make sure somebody read before somebody else wrote. And in that situation, uh, that is why we needed to either have a synchronization or, or use double buffering. Okay. Okay, so that clarifies the distinction between um, uh, having multiple readers and writers in these two situations. Thank you. Yeah, you're professor. Yes. Um, does I'm um, I'm not I'm not exactly seeing why thread coarsening helps because you may be reducing the number of atomic operations at the end, like when you're copying the private copies. But but when you're I mean making the the block I mean each uh, thread take care of more than one input pixel then you might have more atomic operations within one block and I mean especially in the case of pictures and stuff like that like it's likely that that pixels that are like near each other will have the same color right so you you will actually need atomic operations and so it might be worse no. Well, you're absolutely right that when we apply coarsening, uh, we're going to have more atomic operations uh, on the private copy uh, and then fewer on the global copy. But that's okay because the private copy is usually in shared memory. Um, so, uh, so what you can do is you can uh, uh, you can uh, having more having you know more in shared memory and fewer less in global memory is actually we don't have more in shared memory. We have the same amount. Uh, but we have the same amount, but rather than them being on different shared copies and shared memory, they're on the same copy and shared memory. Um, so there is more contention on our shared memory copy over here uh, while having less contention on the global copy. But that's okay because contention on shared memory is much cheaper. The, the atomic operations on shared memory are much cheaper than the ones on global memory. Okay. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, now you're, you, you are absolutely right that threads uh, uh, that are processing the same uh, uh, nearby elements tend to uh, find uh, the same bins because the way uh, images work uh, is that uh, is that you have uh, uh, you have uh, yeah, uh, pixels that are nearby to each other are, are very likely to have a similar color. Uh, now, one thing to know is that a histogram is not only used on pictures, it's used on all kinds of things. Uh, so not all data has this uh, has this uh, property. But yes, in, in images, if pixels are nearby pixels tend to have the same color. Uh, and in this case, threads that are in the same block will, will tend to discover uh, similar bins and, uh, and uh, contend with each other on the same bins and shared memory. One optimization that is uh, sometimes performed is uh, you can have a thread, uh, uh, have an accum uh, accu so when a thread picks up a color, uh, it remembers that color and it has a local accumulator in the register for that color. Uh, and then uh, when it goes and looks at other elements uh, that it's responsible for, if these other elements 
uh, are the same color, it updates the local accumulator that has in the register. And if they're a different color, then it will up, it will commit to the glo to the to the private histogram. Uh, so in this case, if a thread is responsible for like ten pixels and six of them end up uh, being the same color, uh, then it would it, though you would have saved on six atomic operations because you would just update that local. Uh, you would update that local counter in your register and then uh, commit it once to the uh, private copy. And then later on, you can go and commit to the global copy. So, yes, there are all kinds of optimizations that you can do uh, if you know uh, something about the distribution of the, uh, of the data. Um, in particular, if you, uh, if you, in an image, if you know that nearby pixels are going to have the same color, you can uh, do an optimization like this. And this is something uh, that is done in practice. So, thank you for that question. Okay, any other questions? All right, if not, then that's all for today, and I'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.